Well, again, happy Easter, happy Resurrection Day. It's so good to uh, be here with you guys this morning. Uh, kids, I appreciate you hanging in here. I know you're like, oh, great. I got to hear this guy preach for like 30 minutes. I promise I'll try to keep it interesting. Um, you can ask those around you. I am known for my good jokes. So you may even see one of those in there. So um, yeah, two people clap for that one. That was awesome. Um, so let's get right, in, right into this. My sermon title for today is The Difference a Week Makes. The Difference a Week Makes. Um, does anybody like stories? I love stories. I love to hear stories. I'm not really a, a, what most people would call a reader, um, but I like stories and I like to, to hear different stories, just victory stories or whatever it is. Um, and we're obviously going to look at a really cool story for today. Um, but there is this true story um, of a guy, uh, kids, this one's for you also. Uh, this guy was walking through the woods. Okay, he was kind of hiking, he was by himself, and he sees a bear. And he starts freaking out, and he makes some noise, and sure enough, the bear turns and the bear sees him. Well, what happens? The bear starts chasing him. So the guy is running for his life, and this bear is huge. And he's like, listen, I know if this bear catches up to me, I am toast. That's it. I'm done. So like, like he's, he's zigging and zagging, and, 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 but nope, the bear is catching up. And so what does the guy do? He starts praying, which, hey, that's a really good option at that time, right? I would probably start praying too. So the guy starts praying, and like, what, what would he pray about? Well, I would pray like, God, please, you know, let me run faster than the bear. Um, God, keep me safe. God, uh, let the bear stub his toe so he doesn't catch up to me. But no, he doesn't pray that. He prays, Lord, please let this bear be a Christian. <laughs> Just the weirdest prayer, right? Well, the bear catches up to him, and with one swipe, he knocks him down to the ground. And this bear is standing like eight foot tall, and the guy just keeps praying, God, please let this bear be a Christian. And, and the bear is growling, and he's getting ready to eat him, and the bear stops, and the bear gets down on his knees, and he starts to pray. And he says, dear Lord, thank you for this meal I am about to receive. <laughs> Did, did somebody just say that was your best one yet? <laughs> I'll take it, okay? I'll take it. So when we, he okay, kids, anybody got any jokes? No, I'm just kidding. I've done that before. It doesn't work out really well. Um, when we hear a story, what do we usually do? We usually find a character in that story and we relate with that character, don't we? We usually see ourselves as someone in that story. Now, um, maybe you always see yourself as the hero or the main character in the story. And, and we do that sometimes. Uh, just, I just want to be the person to tell you, but you're not always the hero in every story, and neither am I. But we kind of put ourselves in that position sometimes. Um, Maybe you just see yourself as like the supporting role, you know, like you've got the main character and then you're like the best friend, you know, in the rom-com or something like that. Maybe you're just like an innocent bystander. Um, maybe, maybe, and you probably wouldn't qualify yourself as this, maybe you're the villain in the story. Maybe if you're like me, um, it's obvious I'm the comic relief, okay? Just saying, again, that's what I'm known for, obviously. But in God's story, in, in God's entire story, this whole thing that we like to call life, who do you see yourself as? Hopefully not the hero or the main character in God's story. Maybe you're a supporting role. Um, I don't know. Maybe you are the villain. I don't know. But who do you see yourself as? In God's story, maybe you're just an innocent bystander. But what I want to do today is, Pastor Tony kind of opened it up last week with Palm Sunday. And we see Jesus kind of entering into Jerusalem. And this whole week, it just kind of kicks off this series of events. 
And when we hear these different stories, and we're not going to read all the way through, but I want to pick at a bunch of different stories and things that happen throughout the week. And what I'm guessing is, like I was at times, when I hear some of these stories, I don't necessarily um, equate them to the Passion Week or the week in between Palm Sunday and the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. We just kind of think of them as individual stories. So I want to walk us through each day and just read one or two stories from each day. And then maybe we will see some characters along the way, and maybe we will kind of relate to one or two or a few of these characters. So, all right, you guys ready? Here we go. Sunday. Sunday is the triumphal entry or Palm Sunday like we celebrated last week. And in John chapter 12, verse 12, if you want to turn there, we're going to be in John for a few minutes. Uh, All the words are going to be up on the screen, so you don't have to turn there if you don't want. But it says, the next day, the great crowd that had come for the festival had heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. So it says this great crowd. So this makes me think some people were just following the crowd. There was a lot of people, like like it's estimated that there were a couple hundred thousand people in Jerusalem during this time because they would all come to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover. It may have been even way more than that. So I mean, it was crazy packed in Jerusalem. And this crowd is gathered, and Jesus is coming in, and and prophecies are foretold about him, as Pastor Tony uh, said this morning at sunrise service. And there was a crowd just kind of following, seeing what was going on. So here's a question for you. Do you just blend into the world sometimes, especially if you call yourselves a follower of Jesus, or do you stand out? Verse 13. It says, they took palm branches and went out to meet, shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, blessed is the king of Israel. So this leads me to my second qualification. Some people were just looking for Jesus to do something for them. Do you remember what Pastor Tony, I, sorry, I keep beating you up here, but um, you remember what Pastor Tony taught us last week that Hosanna means? What does it mean? It means save us or save now. Now, Jesus came to save them from their sin, but that's not what they were looking to be saved from, was it? What did they want to be saved from? The Romans. They wanted to be saved from oppression. So they were like, oh, this dude, Jesus, man, he is going to set us free. They were right, but they were wrong because they were thinking in the wrong way. So they were just looking for Jesus to do something for them. And then number three, they took palm branches, went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, blessed is the king of Israel. Some people were religious in their words, but worldly in their actions. We see this a lot where people just get all worked up and they, they speak Christianese really well. But you watch them the rest of the week, not on Sunday morning, and it's like, right? It, it, things aren't really matching up. Verse 14, Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it. As it is written, do not be afraid, daughter Zion. See, your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. Now, this has nothing to do with the message today, but some people are a donkey. Amen? <laughs> Just going to leave that one out there. Verse 16, quickly moving past that. At first, his disciples did not understand all this. Only after Jesus was glorified did they realize that these things had been written about him and that these things had been done to him. Now, the crowd that was with him when he called Lazarus from the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to spread the word. Many people, because they had heard that he had performed this sign, went out to meet him. So now we see some people were waiting for Jesus to do something miraculous before they believe. There was a lot of people that were like, Jesus, I'm not sure, but I want to see him do something really cool before I believe. Because I I don't know. I mean, you know, I hear the stories and stories get embellished a little bit. And some people were just waiting for something. 
John 12, 19. So the Pharisees said to one another, see, this is getting us nowhere. Look how the whole world, now that might have been a little bit of an exaggeration, but look how the whole world has gone after him. And some people were looking for a way to disprove Jesus. Here's the Pharisees, the religious leaders of the time who Jesus was threatening them. Jesus was threatening their way of doing things, which was just absolutely incorrect at the time. They had taken the law, God's law, the Old Testament, and just completely skewed it in a way that it was serving them and not serving God. And so Jesus didn't fit into their mold, so they're like, no, 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 we have got to make this guy look bad, we've got to get rid of him because he's going to mess up what we've got going. By the way, we're the most important thing in this story. That's what the Pharisees were doing. So that was Sunday. Then we get to Monday. Jesus curses the fig tree and he clears the temple in Jerusalem. You've heard of those two stories, most of you guys? In Mark chapter 11, verse 12, it says, the next day... As they were leaving Bethany, now Bethany was a town that was very close to Jerusalem, it's where Lazarus was from, and so Jesus and his disciples would travel back and forth just a couple miles from Bethany to Jerusalem every day, and they would walk the same path, and on that path was this fig tree. So it says, the next day, as they were leaving Bethany, Jesus was hungry. Seeing in the distance a fig tree in leaf, he went to find out if it had any fruit. When he reached it, he found nothing but leaves because it was not the season for figs. Then he said to the tree, may no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples heard him say it. Number seven, some people were non-fruit bearing Christians. And I, I use this term Christian loosely because scripture is very, very clear. As followers of Jesus, we are to bear fruit. I mean, we could look at numerous places in Scripture. John 15, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me, you will bear much fruit, otherwise you can do nothing. Matthew, I think it's 25, the parable of the talents, where we were given something and we were supposed to multiply that. So over and over and over, as followers of Jesus, we are supposed to bear fruit. We are supposed to multiply. And I see some people in this story and some people myself included, we often forget that beside worshiping God, we are to be bearing fruit. So that was Monday. Tuesday, Tuesday, the disciples pass back by the withered tree in the morning, uh, and then in Tuesday, later on that day, we have the Olivet Discourse, which is a humongous teaching by Jesus. Maybe sometime I'll, I'll, I'll try to break this down, but not today. There's so much in there. So In Mark chapter 11, verse 20, it says, In the morning, as they went along, they saw the fig tree withered from the roots. Peter remembered and said to Jesus, Rabbi, look, the fig tree you cursed has withered. Now, like I want to go, Peter, bro, it's Jesus. Like, yeah, it's withered. Jesus cursed the tree. And, but, you know, and I, so I want to kind of knock Peter a little bit for not having faith. But, and then I go, yeah, I would, I would probably be right there along with Peter. But Peter is just astounded. No way this tree is withered. And that makes me think some people have been following Jesus for years but are still lacking faith or are spiritually illiterate. Don't that, let that be you, church. Don't don't follow Jesus for years. Don't don't say he is your savior. And then, like, you can quote John 3, 16, and there's no fruit in your life. That's what God put us here for, to worship him, to bear fruit, to honor him, to get into his word. It is a joy to see God in his word and what God wants to do in us and through us and for us. So let's not be spiritually illiterate like Peter was. So that's Tuesday. Wednesday, we've got preparations for the Passover. And the Passover, remember, was this big meal that they were going to prepare and celebrate, right? So Luke 22, verse 1, it says, Now the festival of unleavened bread called the Passover was approaching. And the chief priests and the teachers of the law were looking for some way to get rid of Jesus. I'm going to go back here because my notes just deleted. Here we go. 
Where are we at? Wednesday, right? Okay, I just want to make sure you guys are paying attention. (laughs) And the chief priests and the teachers of the law were looking for some way to get rid of Jesus, for they were, what? Afraid of the people. Ooh, that's a really bad position to be in. When you are more afraid of people than you are concerned with what God has for you, that is not a good place to be. So some people's actions are more based on what people will think than what Jesus will think. So that was Wednesday. Thursday. Thursday's a big day. Thursday we have the Last Supper, which is the Passover meal. Uh, Jesus is betrayed and arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane. So we, it, it, I'll just kind of paint a little visual for you here. We have the Last Supper, and, it's, and just kind of look at it up in Jerusalem up here. And we've got the upper room, as it was called, where Jesus had the Last Supper. And he would come out of there, kind of right down the hill, down into the Kidron Valley. And right up on the other side of the valley was the Mount of Olives. So Jesus would often go from the city to the Mount of Olives to pray all of the time. So that's what happened. They had the Passover meal. They went down the Kidron Valley and right up into the Mount of Olives, into the Garden of Gethsemane. So Matthew 26, verse 31, it says, Then Jesus told them, This very night you will fall away on account of me. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. That was a prophecy. Verse 32, but after I have risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. Peter replied, even if all fall away on account of you, I never will. Truly, I tell you, Jesus answered, this very night before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. But Peter declared, even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. And all the other disciples said the same. Some people were well-intentioned in their faith, but lacked follow-through. And church, if I'm just being honest, this is probably the one where I struggle with. Like, I'm well-intentioned in my faith, and and, hey, this is a calling, but this is kind of what I have to do every week, and I have to study, and I have to come up here and give this message to you. But man, there are times in, in my life, just in my regular week, where it's like, It's tough to do what God has called me to do. And I I know you guys share that same struggle. And so we have got to have follow through and and follow this calling that God has on our lives as followers of Jesus. So that was Thursday. And then we come to Friday. Friday we have trials or questioning by Annas, Caiaphas, who were the high priests, Uh, The Sanhedrin, which is the religious court, he goes to Pilate, he goes to Herod, and then he goes back to Pilate, and then he's crucified. So in John 18, verse 19, it says, Meanwhile, the high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and his teaching. In Matthew 26, 63, now watch as I read all four of these verses. Watch for a theme in these verses. Matthew 26, 63, but Jesus remained silent. The high priest said to him, I charge you under oath by the living God. Tell us if you are the Messiah, the Son of God. Matthew 27, 11. Meanwhile, Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? What keeps happening in these different circumstances? What are they questioning? His authority. Look at Luke 23, 11. Then Herod and his soldiers ridiculed and mocked him, dressing him in an elegant robe. They sent him back to Pilate. Some people question Jesus' authority. Okay, and again, Pastor Tony broke it down so well this morning. Oh, you know, you could say he's a good teacher, he was a prophet. You actually can't say any of those things because Jesus didn't claim to be a good teacher or just a prophet or just a man. Jesus claimed to be the Son of God. And that is all that we can say that he is. Nothing less than that. So I guess the question is, do you question Jesus' authority in your life? Like, does Jesus have access to every area of your life. 
And I was thinking about it this week. Jesus is a 24-7, 365 Savior, right? Like, like, like all of the time, he saves us. So I guess the real question is, is he the 24-7, 365 Lord or Master of your life? That word Lord is not a name. It's a title, Master, in charge of. Is Jesus Lord of every single area of your life? Or do you only give him authority, again, maybe on Sunday morning or on Easter or Christmas or when things are going well in your life? He's an all-time Savior. So then we move on. Pilate's questioning Jesus. And in Matthew 27, 22, it says, What shall I do then with Jesus, who is called the Messiah? Pilate asked. They all answered, Crucify him. Wow. Verse 23, Why? What crime has he committed? Asked Pilate. But they shouted all the louder, Crucify him. And this makes me think some people were done with Jesus when it looks like he had nothing left to offer. I I want you to picture Jesus. Many of you guys have seen the movie, The Passion of the Christ, and and Jesus is just beaten, bloodied, bruised. I mean, his his bones were showing. I mean, it it was an awful scene. I, I don't even think the movie did it justice to how I believe they treated Jesus. Picture him standing up there in front of this crowd, beaten, bloodied, looking like he has nothing to offer at that time, and how quickly the crowd turned on him. Oh, he's not going to be the savior that we wanted? Oh, we're done with him. We don't really need him anymore. It looked like he had nothing left to offer, and oh, what a difference a week makes. We went from Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, blessed is the king of Israel, to the same crowd yelling, crucify him. Why? Why? Why did we so quickly change? Here's why. Because Jesus didn't do things like they expected him to. That's why they turned. Now, we're here on Easter morning in a church. Does that sound like a good enough reason? No. But maybe, is this what we do sometimes in our lives? That Jesus didn't do things like we expected him to? And we think less of him. Yeah, okay, he's still our savior, but I'm just, I'm going to do this on my own. So we move on. Jesus is crucified. He's hanging on the cross in Matthew 27, verse 45. We're going to park here for a minute. It says, from noon until three in the afternoon, darkness came over all the land. About three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Which is Psalm chapter 22. Verse 47, when some of those standing there heard this, they said, he's calling Elijah. Immediately, one of them ran and got a sponge. He filled it with wine vinegar, put it on a staff, and offered it to Jesus to drink. The rest said, now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to save him. And when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook, the rocks split, and the tombs broke open. The bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. They came out of the tombs after Jesus' resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared to many people. When the centurion and those who were with him guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and all that had happened, they were terrified and exclaimed, surely he was the son of God. 
This makes me think some people will only be convinced about Jesus when there is clear evidence, which is basically what we said earlier. Don't wait for that evidence. That's not what faith is. John 20, verse 29 says, Then Jesus told him, this is our friend Doubting Thomas, Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. So that was Friday. Jesus dies on the cross and is hanging there. Not much is said in Scripture about Sunday or Saturday. I'm sure it was a pretty somber day. I'm sure the disciples were pretty afraid. They went and locked themselves in the room. They were hiding because they said, hey, if they killed Jesus, we're next. And, well, they were pretty much right over time. And then we get to Sunday, the best day. We've got the resurrection, and there's some appearances of Jesus that we see in Scripture. But it's the pivotal moment, the most important event of all of history happened that Sunday morning. And there's something, or I should probably say someone, that's way more important in this story than who you are and who you see yourself in this story. And of course, that's Jesus. There's a real hero here. In Matthew 28, verse 1, it says, After the Sabbath, at the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. They fainted. The angel said to the women, do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. Here's some of the best words in history right here, church. He is not here. He has risen just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples, he has risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Now I have told you. So the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid, yet filled with joy, and ran to tell his disciples. Suddenly Jesus met them. Greetings, he said. They came to him, clasped his feet, and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. There's no comparison here. I'm not going to give you some people. Were, no, no, no. It's just Jesus. Right now, I just want us to realize and celebrate the Savior of the world. The, the, the very same Savior who gave and is giving us an opportunity to put our faith and our trust in Him. That's the Jesus that I follow. That's the Jesus of the Bible. But there's one person in this story that we skipped. And just for the last couple of minutes that we have here, yeah, Jesus is the main character, obviously. But there's a character in this story that I think we can all relate to. Maybe you found yourself relating to some of these other people who we kind of see in these stories. But there's one that... <laughs> I know really resonates with me. So we'll back up a little bit. Matthew 27, verse 15. Pilate is questioning Jesus again. In verse 15, it says, Now it was the governor's custom at the festival to release a prisoner chosen by the crowd. At that time, they had a well known prisoner whose name was Jesus Barabbas. Now, maybe you didn't know Barabbas' his name was actually Jesus Barabbas. Coincidence, maybe. So when the crowd had gathered, Pilate asked them, which one do you want me to release to you, Jesus Barabbas or Jesus who was called the Messiah? For he knew it was out of self-interest that they had handed Jesus over to him. While Pilate was sitting on the judge's seat, his wife sent him this message, don't have anything to do with that innocent man. 
for I have suffered a great deal today in a dream because of him. But the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and to have Jesus executed. Which of the two do you want me to release to you? asked the governor. Barabbas, they answered. What shall I do then with Jesus, who is called the Messiah, Pilate asked. They all answered, crucify him. These are the verses that we read earlier. Why? What, t- what crime has he committed, asked Pilate. But they shouted all the louder, crucify him. When Pilate saw that he was getting nowhere, but that instead an uproar was starting, he took water and washed his hands in front of the crowd. I am innocent of this man's blood, he said. It is your responsibility. All the people answered, his blood is on us and our children. Then he released Barabbas to them, but he had Jesus flogged and handed him over to be crucified. Scripture describes Barabbas as four things, a notorious criminal, an insurrectionist, a robber, and a murderer. It even talks about him in the book of Acts, calls him a murderer. And honestly, (laughs) he was just like us. Now, maybe you've not done all of those things. But Scripture says even one sin is enough. So don't think, well, I'm, I'm, I'm not as bad as Barabbas. I'm maybe over here. Well, just one, if there was such a thing, white lie, which it's just a lie, but just one white lie on your account would keep you from entering into eternity with Jesus in heaven. So we've got a problem. And Jesus was the solution, and he is the solution. And Barabbas, just like us, was a sinner who was offered grace and mercy because of a Savior. And that's what Jesus is offering us this morning. Jesus is offering grace and mercy. I don't know about you, but I need as much grace and mercy in my life as I can get because I am a sinner in need of a Savior. So right now, this morning, I want to give you an opportunity to know Jesus, not to know some things about Jesus, not to know the stories, not to rely on your grandma's faith or your church attendance or none of that. I want you this morning to have an opportunity to have a relationship with Jesus. That's what this is about. So would you bow your heads? If that's you this morning, say, you know what, I've relied on too many other things in my life for my salvation. I've relied on my church attendance or I've relied on being good enough. Scripture's pretty clear. You can't good enough your way into heaven. But right now in this moment, I want to give you an opportunity to start a relationship with Jesus. If that's you, right where you are, to yourself even, Say, Jesus, thank you. Thank you for being a savior. Jesus, thank you for being my savior. Thank you, Jesus, for hanging on a cross for me. Please take away my sin, nail them to the cross. Wash me clean. Jesus, you gave your life for me. God, I give my life to you. Lord, save me. Lord, change me. Today is the day 
that I make Jesus my Savior. Heads are still bowed, eyes are closed. If you said that this morning for the first time, you decided today is the day that you wanted to start a relationship with Jesus. Will you just slide your hand up? I'm not going to call you out. I'm not going to make any deal of it. I just want to be able to pray for you. We just put your hand up and say, today's the day. I got it right. Thank you. Today is the day that I decided to give my life to Jesus. Thank you. Jesus, we thank you for your sacrifice. We thank you that you chose to give up your life, to hang on a cross, to be beaten and slain for us. thank you that you are the sacrificial lamb so that we may spend eternity with you. God, I pray for all of those here this morning. God, would you help us to be the followers of Jesus that we need to be? God, help us to keep our eyes focused on you. Help us to multiply and bear fruit. Help us to run to you when times are tough. And thank you, God, that we know that you will be there with open arms, ready for us. Thank you, God, that you are good. Thank you for your grace and mercy that you poured out to us when you shed your blood on this cross. God, we lift up this time of offering. God, be blessed by what we do. God, help us to be a generous church so that we can reach this community and this world and further your kingdom in whatever way we can. Jesus, we love you, we praise you, and it is in your awesome and holy name that we pray. Amen. Mm-hmm.